peace in the valley. Having peace in the valley. Now, I know most of you know the song, and you probably think the song is talking about a place where there's peace. Well, usually, the valley is usually a place where um, it's a difficult time in your life. Something's going on uh, that's not pleasant in your life. And you know, last few days, I've taken a little bit of time. I, I wanted to try to understand what happened with the, um, the Jewish people during the Holocaust. And there's a lot of that information on YouTube. And I began to watch it. I began to uh, hear from these people that lived through it. Very few people, probably only 5% of the people lived through it that went to it, went to concentration camps. And uh, watching that stuff, and I, the thought came to mind, I don't understand this. When they delivered those Jewish people uh, uh, to those camps, they unloaded at, at any given time, they unloaded thousands at a time out of the cattle cars. And they could have easily overran those guards. But they didn't. And they were healthy at that point. I mean, these people, for the most part, were pretty healthy. And, uh, but for some reason, I couldn't understand that. And they began to explain why. These, these people that survived it said, well, we were systematically uh, led step by step we were in confusion all the time. We never knew what was going on. When it got to the concentration camps, they saw this big smokestack, and, and, um, but they still didn't realize what was happening. Nobody had, there were very few people that ever escaped. I don't know if there was anybody that ever escaped out of those camps to tell anybody what was really going on there. And, um, you know, uh, the thing is, um, so often we're in a valley and I got to thinking well I've never had anything in my life like what those people went through and uh, some of them that survived it the things they talked about you know so often we think we have it so bad and you know I, I noticed on there there's this uh, uh, a site that it's kind of I don't like that but it's a it's a site where they tell you the People that committed suicide, the notable people this year. That thing is endless. And most of it started in March and April. The bulk of them started in March and April. And, you know, you hear about young people uh, that uh, take their life. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and my goodness, they've never been th through anything like these people that went through the Holocaust. And all they wanted to do was live. Die. And but it's from time to time, and I'll talk about some in the Bible that came to that place in their life where they just would rather die than live. We read about this man Moses, you know, and God raised him up to do something that I don't think Moses really wanted to do it. Amen. I really don't think Moses, I mean, he argued with the Lord about it. He said, I'm I'm slow of speech, you know, I, I'm not capable of speaking, public speaking, you know. And he said, I'll give you a mouthpiece. And he gave Mary. But, I mean, you know, he just, you know, he said, the people won't follow me. He had every excuse in the world. He was a reluctant uh, uh, candidate. Amen. And um, Moses, even he committed to, to doing what God said. And, you know, uh, the people murmured against him. Here's a man who didn't want to be there, didn't want to be in that position. And now the people murmur against him to add to his own misery. Amen? And uh, boy, I tell you what, if I'd have been him, I'd said, Lord, kill them all. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> I mean, yeah. And they come over here, the Bible tells us, the people were complaining. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this is after the, uh, you know, the spies come back, you know, and all that. And uh, they discouraged the people. And then in verse 11 of chapter, of Numbers chapter 11, it said, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned, burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses. Moses prayed unto the Lord, and the fire was quenched. 
And he called the name of the place Taberer, because of the fire of the Lord burned among them. And a mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we eat in uh, Egypt freely, and the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlics. They forgot something else. They forgot the whips on their back. Amen. They forgot the, the burdensome tasks they had to perform. They were slaves. How easy we forget the hard times we had before we were saved. Amen. I got nothing to go back to. Amen. There ain't nothing I want to go back to in my life. I didn't understand this. These people want to go back to Egypt. But now our soul is dried away and there's nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. They're complaining about the manna. Man, that was heavenly angel food. Amen? And they say, and the manna, and the manna was a corinder seed. The color thereof was a color of bedelium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in meals and beat it in mortar and baked it in pans and made cake of it. And the taste of it was the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp at night, the manna fell upon it. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout uh, their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses was the also Moses also was displeased, and Moses said unto God, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I found I have not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden all this people on me upon me? I have conceived. All this people, no, he said, have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldst say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth a suckling child and unto the land which they, thou swearest unto their fathers? Whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people that they weep unto me, saying, give us flesh that we may eat? Now you can see Moses is having a pretty rough time here. Amen. You'd have to admit that. Um he was definitely in a valley here. He says, uh, "He said, wherein we have done foolishly, and where we no wait. I, I think I turned the page too far. Hold on. Okay. Um, he said, I'm not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of the hand, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, let me not see my wretchedness." <laughs> Moses said, "Come on, God, just kill me." Now, he's in a bad place, amen? I'd say he lost his joy, amen? I thought, you know, I thought that wasn't supposed to happen to believers, but it does. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight, having peace when you're in the valley. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. And Lord, I, I know it's a difficult time for people in our country today, Lord. I know that, God, the suicide rate is so high, and, and God, uh, people are finding not, no reason to live. But God, certainly that ought not to be for the Christian. And God, help us if we just stay focused on the task before us and keep our eyes on Jesus, Lord. There's nothing we can't get through. I pray for our church family, Lord. God, I pray that they'll be excited about the things of God. They'll not be uh, swayed by the world. They'll not be um, led to... Uh, God, to think these kind of things and think this way. Help us, Lord, to encourage one another. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I could also have you turn over to, uh, I hesitated doing this because I'm teaching through the book, but uh, if you turn over to 1 Kings chapter 19, I've been teaching Sunday school, and I'm done now because Henry's coming back. Um, I was teaching on Elijah. What a great study that is on this man Elijah. Now, he did some great things for God. But you need to understand, Elijah was just, just a mortal man. He was not supernatural. Sure, he prayed fire down from heaven. Uh, you know, and God sent the fire. Uh, but there came a time, not too far after that, uh, that Elijah uh, has a, a bout of depression, like Moses. And he says this, and he came in verse 9 of chapter 19. 
And Elijah says this, And he came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he said unto him, Why dost thou hear? He said, What doest thou hear, Elijah? And he said, I am, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel and have forsaken that have, he said, the children of Israel have forsaken the co thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain the prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, are left, and they seek my life to take it away. You know, we don't have, when we're, where we're in a place of depression or we're down, often we don't see things the way they really are. Right? We build cases in our mind that aren't true. He said, I'm the only one, Lord. Now let's read on. And he said, he said, I'm the only one. Uh, and they seek me to take my life. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passeth by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces of rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind after the wind and earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord of God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altar, slain the prophets with the sword. And even I, only I am left here. He says it again. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return thy way into the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, uh, anointest Hazael, Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, uh, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Sephat, of uh, Abelameho, Ab Ab Hola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in the room. And it shall come to pass that uh, him that escaped the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escaped it from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Uh, yet I have, now listen, this is what God said, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. He said, I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. So his Thinking was marred, wasn't it? Because he was in a valley. Now let's talk about being in the valley tonight for just a little bit. And you know there's all kinds of things that can get us there. You know, let's think about it. Um, maybe a family problem. Maybe having issues. My brother and my sister are having issues right now. And they're both calling me. They're driving me crazy. Pray for me. They really are. They're driving me crazy. Um, and... Um, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to help them. Neither one of them go to church. They claim to be saved. And it's hard for me to help them with issues that they have. But they, they literally are driving me nuts. And, um, well, I hope this ain't recorded tonight. Hi, right, Raymond. I was talking about, oh, I don't have another brother. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, even though we have accepted Christ as our Savior, it does not mean uh, you... Uh, will always experience that mountaintop feeling. Amen? I know better than that. You know what I know? I know when things are going good, you better watch out. <laughs> you know, it's just that way. It really is. Now, every Christian sometimes experiences feelings of being in the valley. Um, and uh, like I said, there's many things that can bring, maybe, maybe loss of your employment, maybe... Uh, car trouble, you know, I mean, really, um, maybe uh, financial setbacks, uh, maybe health problems, um, you know, maybe this stupid virus, amen, stuff. There are a lot of things, maybe um, uh, uh, problems with somebody you were friends with, whatever. Um, but there are a lot of things that, that can cause a person uh, to find themselves a Christian, to find themselves in the valley. Now, the song Peace in the Valley doesn't mean there's peace in the valley all the time. It means it's difficult to find peace in the valley. Amen? Um, you're going through a hard time. That's, what it, that's why it's a valley. 
you're going through a trial, you're going through some kind of problem in your life. All right? Now, excitement's not there anymore as far as what we have as a Christian. Um, The joy has lessened. Um, That tingle inside you is gone. Um, Prayer is not enjoyable anymore. I'm just being honest with you. I've been there. Reading your Bible becomes hard. Uh, That's what happens a lot when we're in the valley. Amen? It happens, number two, it happens to everyone. I have never known anybody that has, has never had times when they were disappointed or down or even depressed. You know, I have, I have known, personally known preachers that committed suicide. It's hard to believe that a man of God could do that. You say, were they saved? Yeah, I believe they're saved. I believe they're in heaven, but I believe they didn't do what God wanted them to do. There's a loss of reward there. Two of them were true. Two of them were two of the greatest preachers I'd ever heard in my life. I could not believe. One of them was uh, two of them. The two that were the greatest preachers. One was the pastor of a church running over six thousand in Georgia. The other was a pastor that had pastored tremendous churches. He pastored Kansas City for many years. Pastored in Detroit. He actually pastored. J.B. Vick's great church there in in Detroit. These weren't little time, you know, um, off the beaten track preachers. These were renowned preachers. I knew an evangelist, great evangelist. I heard him preach in New Martinsville, West Virginia. Man, he was a tremendous preacher. Did not know it at the time, but they had him on antidepressants. Six months after I heard him, he took his own life. At the time he took his own life, he was one of the premier evangelists in America. So nobody's inaliated, from, you know, inaliated from it. I mean, it's it comes to all of us, no matter who you are. You might think, well, you know, it only happens to those, uh, you know, that are, uh, you know, on the fringes. No, it happens to everybody. And we need to be careful with this thing. We need to know how, you know, we think, oh, it's those people that are backslidden. That's who goes through these valley scenarios or it's the people that are uh, they're in deep sin no I've known people that none of that was true in their life none of that was true in their life Um, I know people these people were just trying to as far as I knew they were trying to please, please God and they found themselves in some kind of a valley that you know brother uh, we just had here and preached, Brother uh, uh, Monty, Mar- Mark. I knew his brother, Mike. And we were good friends. I met him years ago down at Brother Jividen's church, and, and I was going to go there and preach at his church. He wanted me to preach on Sunday morning. Sunday night, I was taking, going to take my fifth wheel and go to Minnesota, but that's when Brother Dennis was real sick, and I couldn't go. I never heard from him after that because Brother Jividen had died, and I don't go down there anymore. So I kind of lost contact with him. And the night that first time Brother Monty, I heard him preach, he mentioned his brother committed suicide. And he said his name. And I was shocked. I knew I didn't think somebody like that could do that. But see, um, some things happened. And he he got in a position where he was uh, depressed over some things. The doctor put him on some medication. And things didn't go well. But I'm telling you, we need to be careful when we're in the valley and know how to get out of the valley. Now, what God reveals to us um, usually in the valley is this. It's a place of learning. You need to understand that. When you're in a valley, you need to say, hey, wait a minute. Now, why am I here? Obviously, I'm here for a reason. Nothing happens by accident with God, right? Um, I mean, it's an appointment. I'm here by an appointment. And what is that appointment? God is trying, because I know people that went into a valley, a tremendous valley, it was nothing they did wrong. That's what I'm saying. And so you have to ask the question when you're in a valley, why am I in a valley? Well, obvious reason is God is trying to teach you something. That's what was going on in Elijah's life. That's what was going on in Moses' life. God was trying to teach them something. 
And you know, uh, I don't like the valley. But I know these, a few times I've been in, you know, and I've been in some deep valleys, believe me. I told you about time I was going to quit on God for the second time uh, when a preacher caused me to lose my job. And, man, that was a valley, man. It was a deep valley. My wife was ready to have a baby. I had I'd lost my insurance, everything, man. Now I was in a mess. And um, uh, God taught me a, a real good lesson then. Said, uh, just don't do it because your preacher says so. You better pray about it first. That was a lesson I learned. Amen. And I learned this: no matter what happened to me, God will get my feet back on the on track. Amen. Things will get better. They always do. Amen. And so I learned some things from that valley, and uh, you know, God used that to get me where He wanted me to. I was pretty comfortable where I was, and I don't know if I hadn't went through that valley. If I, if I would have went to where God wanted me to go. So I learned some lessons from that. And we need to realize that a lot of times when we go into a valley, uh, God is trying to show us or teach us something. I know you'll find out that He's real. Amen. If you hang on, you'll find out God's real. I know you'll find out who uh, truly loves you. Amen. And I know that um, you'll find that just trying to please God, um, you'll, uh, you'll end up coming out of the valley. If you just make up your mind, no matter what's going on in your life, you're just going to try to please God. Remember Job said, he said, I, I prayed uh, on the right hand where I perceive him, but he's not there. He said, I prayed on the left. He's not there. He said, I went backward. He was not there. What did he say? He said, I'm going to, he said, I'm going to, my feet are going to hold to his commandments. In other words, he said, I'm going to keep doing what he says. He said, even though I can't perceive him, even though I'm in this mess, he was in a tremendous valley. I mean, how much bigger a valley could you be in when you can't find God? Amen. And he said, I'm just going to, my feet are going to hold to his commandments. He said, I esteem the, his words more than my necessary food. That's what Job said. And that's when we really have got to stay close to God's word when we're in the valley. All right? Now, stay on schedule. That's what I was just talking about. Do exactly what you were doing before you wound up in the valley. Don't quit reading your Bible. Don't quit praying. You know, as hard as it is and as upset as you are and maybe uh, hurt as you are, the worst thing you want to do is get away from God. That won't help anything. Just stay in the Word of God and keep praying and asking God to help you. Now, um, God wants, wants us to serve Him. Why? Because he saved us. Amen. Why else would you serve God? Amen. God wants us to serve him because we love him. Not because it feels good to serve him. I, you know, let's be honest, we've all been in that place. It just didn't feel good to read our Bible or pray, did it? But we've got to keep going. We gotta, when we're in the valley, we've got to keep doing the things we know are right. Avoid, and I always say this to you. You know, I often refer to valleys as crisis time. And I say you don't make any long-term decisions in a time of crisis. I'm going to tell you a story. I'll try to hurry with this. I have a good friend named Sam Wade. Sam's a very good friend. We still are friends. I'd left the church and took a church uh, job down in Wheeling, uh, not, not Wheeling, but um, Louisville. I was there three years, and the Lord led me to Wheeling to start a church. Wheeling is only about, I'd say, 55, 60 miles from the church I was before I went to Louisville, which my home church was Waynesburg, Pennsylvania, where I went, went after, right after I got to college. And that's where I met Sam Wade, and he was still serving there. And um, Sam called me one day when I was in Wheeling and told me about it. the preacher there had left, and they were looking for a new preacher, and he called me one day, and he 
He told me about a preacher that had come candidate from Michigan. Always be careful of Michigan preachers. Yeah, yeah this fellow, he's from Michigan. And he came and preached, and uh, the consensus of the church was that he was not the preacher they wanted. Sam told me that. He said, I don't know if the church will vote him in, but he said, I, I think they ought to. Uh, two months later, on a Sunday morning, Sam and his wife showed up at my church in Wheeling. I thought that was odd, to drive 60 miles one way to come to my church when they had a new pastor. They called that man from Michigan. That man came from Michigan, and um, he was there... Uh, I guess for about a month, and they were out one night eating with him. And Sam's wife was there, and another deacon that I worked with, uh, Brother Bill Orndorff, and his wife Kathy was there, and Linda, you know, Sam's wife, and the preacher and his wife. And that preacher, they asked that preacher, said, do you know Roy Phillips? And he said, I, I've heard that name. Um, and then he said something very derogative about my wife. And those ladies were appalled. And the guys just sat there. And the ladies got up and they said, uh, we're going to go to the bathroom. When they came back, they motioned. The preacher was back with them. They motioned for their husband to come over. And they said, are you going to say anything to him about that? Or are you going to let him say that about Bessie? Boy, they were furious. And so... Sam said something about it. And then he made a derogative remark about Sam's wife. And so Sam went to his house the next day. And the preacher, he knocked on the door and he says, I really need to talk to you. And uh, the preacher rebuked him for coming to his house and then he cursed him out. He really did. When Sam told me what he said, I couldn't believe any preacher would say those kind of words. But Sam told me, he said, you know, he said, uh, this is my fault because me and Brother Bill, we politicked him in there to get him in. We politicked him to get him in. And he said, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, uh, I don't know what to tell you because I know it's 120 mile round trip to my church. I wasn't going to that's not good for anybody to do. That's hard for you to serve in a church when you drive that far. But I felt bad for him. But I told him just to hang on. But he decided just to quit church. He made a bad decision at a bad time. Three weeks later, that preacher was out there. He was out three weeks later. He was gone. But Sam had already quit church and told the people he quit. That went there. All these years... It's cost him his kids. They won't go to church. Every time I, I don't like to go on Facebook, but every time I'd see his daughter, she's always got a glass of liquor in her hand. They're partying somewhere. She's a school teacher there in Greene County at um, Mapletown High School. His two sons are just basically atheists. And they, they were just coming to, they were in their teen years when he quit church. And, um, you can't go, he can't go back and change that. But he made a bad decision when he was in a bad place, a valley. Please don't do that. I almost did that. I don't know what would happen if I had quit the second time on God. I barely made it back the first time. But I'm glad God didn't, you know, well, thank God my wife, amen. <laughs> she wasn't going to let me do that again. She'd kill me before she'd let me do that again. She was more miserable than I was. But don't make a decision in a time of crisis. That's the wrong time to make a decision because, again, just like Moses, just like, uh, you know, Moses couldn't see the big picture. He was leading God's people into the promised land. Uh, Elijah, he couldn't see the picture. He thought he was the only one serving God. So I said, you're not the only one. I got 7,000 never bowed a knee. And so often, again, we make bad decisions uh, when, in a time of crisis. We ought not to make a decision where we're in a crisis. Wait till the crisis clears, and then if you have to make a decision, you're thinking better about it. Amen?
Many have taken their families like Sam did. I will of God by making a decision in the valley. Don't ever do that. I've done it and I made a bad decision coming out of college and and I, I got wasted years there. And I, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, don't make a decision in the midst of a crisis. Now, another thing is we're prone to, when we're in a valley, we're, pr- we're prone to blame it on other people. Remember what I said? God's in control. You're in a valley. God's trying to teach you something. Now, he may have used other people to get you there. <laughs> I won't say that doesn't happen, amen? But we ought not to blame them. Amen? You know, all of us had so-called Christians do things to us that weren't good. Haven't we all that have been saved any length of time? And you know my friend Wayne Adams. He, we were on staff together in Louisville. Wayne didn't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. He was a lot of fun, though. He really was. But he had, he had a lot of street sense. You know what I mean? He really did. He had a lot of horse sense, I guess you'd call it. He was younger than me. Uh, one of my bus drivers that drove a bus started giving me some issues about uh, some things with the, uh, the areas they, with some of the areas they were going with the buses and stuff, and and we had discussion about it, and he was upset with me about it, and I was kind of angry with him about it. And uh, Wayne came to me, and Wayne said, "So you're you're mad at this fellow named Ronnie?" I said, "Yeah, I'm mad at Ronnie. That's very obvious." And he says, "Well, listen, look at it this way." Ronnie's really a good guy. He was before this, wasn't he? I said, yeah, never had any problem with him. He said, well, you know what? It's not Ronnie. The devil's just using him to upset you. And it's not really Ronnie. He wouldn't normally do that. And you know that helped me. I realized that sometimes the devil will use people. They're unaware of it, that they're being used of the devil. And, and, and we'll be angry with them when we really ought to be mad at the devil. Amen. You know, God's not the author of confusion. Do you know that? Anytime there's confusion like that, it's caused by the devil. We shouldn't be angry at a brother. The Bible says, be, not, be angry not with a brother. We're not to be angry with each other. Amen? It happens. I know that. Sometimes there's misunderstanding. But let's, let's always keep the target on the real uh, individual caused it. That's Satan. Amen? Let's be mad at Satan, not each other. Amen? Amen. Do not accuse anyone else. Do not blame someone else for you being in the valley. You know, it, after all, it's your responsibility to stay where God wants you. Amen? Now, again, you're in a valley. Here's something that will help you. Forget about what your situation is. What about your situation and help somebody else that's in the valley? I remember years ago, a young man that I met in a Bible college. He and his parents had, were on staff at a big independent Baptist church. This church ran probably eight, nine thousand every Sunday. And his parents were, his dad was a pastor, one of the um, uh, I call him a pastor. He wasn't a main pastor, but he was a pastor. And he was in charge of a lot of the Sunday school and all that. Uh, there were some divisions he was in charge of. Church that big, you got all kinds of different groups within the church. And um, they were serving the Lord, him and his wife. They were very dedicated Christians. They loved the Lord, probably two of the best Christians and preachers that pastor said that he had ever worked with. Their son graduated from Christian school, and um, he got a job with a company, and the company transferred him down to St. Louis. He went to St. Louis and began working there, and he got got introduced to new people there and uh, got hooked up with some bad influences. And it wasn't long he was going to nightclubs. He began drinking and using drugs. Um, among other things, he began doing real uh, wicked. And um, he felt obliged to let his mom and dad know what he was doing. And it just broke their heart. He boasted what he was doing. And, of 
course, he'd like to blame them and say it was their fault because they were strict and all that, you know. Made some real bad choices. They went to the pastor about it and they said, we feel like we ought to resign. He said, we don't feel like we're fit to serve in a church, our son living like that. That preacher was very gentle with him. He said, I know what you're going through. He said, first of all, he's not part of your household anymore. So you're not responsible for him now. Secondly, he said, I would recommend that you just turn him over to God. And he said, you guys just get as close to God as you've ever been in your life. Do more than you've ever done in your life and let God take care of the problem. It was about six months later. Boy, I'll tell you what, the conviction came upon that young man and he told me about it, about it in college. How that all of a sudden the conviction of God came upon him and he couldn't stand it. I mean, it, I'm telling you, it was awful, he said. I never had felt like that in my life. It was, it was so bad. The conviction of God. And he got right with God over that. And he called his parents and he told them what had happened. Matter of fact, Squire Parsons wrote a song about that boy. It's called, uh, he said, uh, it's called Mama. He said, I just want to call you and tell you what happened to me. It's a beautiful song if you ever hear it. But you see, those, that couple was in a valley. They didn't know what to do. They're going to quit on God themselves. They're going to give up what God had called them to do. Preacher said, don't do that. Don't quit on God. Don't quit on God. And, and you know, told them to pray for this son of theirs. And so what did they do? They, they helped their son out of that valley. Amen? And we're in a valley. We ought to spend our time praying for people also that are in the valley. Amen? Find someone else in the valley, valley and help them get out of it. Amen? Encourage somebody. Uh, watch as God will lift you uh, out of the valley so that you can encourage somebody else that's in the valley. Amen? i tell you what, I've been. I've been there. I don't like it. I don't want to go there. But I know this. If I live very much longer, I'll be in it again. Amen? I know that. I know that. You know, um, God's helped me with Bessie's illness because, you know, that, that was a tough thing. You know, I've told you before, this, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I mean, you know, come on, Lord. You know, I answered the call, but I didn't sign up for this now. Hey, it's part of life. Things like that are going to come into our life, no matter how we live and serve God. They're just going to come. You could be the best Christian in the world. Some problems are going to come into your life. That's what this world is all about. This world is all about that. Now, the world we're headed for, there is none of that there. Amen. There are no valleys there. You know, I heard preachers talk about the hills of heaven. David said, I'll look to the hills from whence I come. Or, and they try to say there's hills in heaven. How can you have hills without valleys? I don't understand that. I know there are any valleys in heaven. Amen. Thank God. There are no valleys. Valleys will all be over when we leave this world. Amen. Let's bow. Father, I thank you, Lord, tonight that you're in the valley with us. You say, though I walk, your servant said, though I walk through this valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Thou comforts me. Lord, God, we need to realize that we're in a valley that You've not left us. You're right there with us. You promised that you'd never leave us nor forsake us. Is there anybody here tonight in the valley? Lord, help them to realize that, God, they're not alone. There's other brethren there. And more important, you're there. And God, help us remember that next time we're discouraged and we're in a valley. Help us not do the, that terrible thing and quit on you, God. Help us to abstain from even thinking that way. Help us to use that time to encourage others in spite of what's going on in our own life. Many times I've been encouraged by people, Lord, that were in a worse mess than I was. And yet they took the time to encourage me and help me in the valley. Help us to be like that, Lord. Thank you for 
the Word of God, Lord. Thank you for your promises in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.